Well, good morning, Wildwood Church. How are we doing this morning? Good, good to see you this morning. Open your Bibles to Luke chapter 20, verse 9 through 18. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the chair in front of you. It's page 879 in that Bible. Uh, we are back in to seek and to save. The mission of Jesus is told by Luke. I like being in these series because it's right here. It's nine verses. What does this say? And you can't be mad at me because I didn't make this stuff up, right? It's just right here. And uh, not that you ever get mad at me about anything that I say, really. Amen? Right? Because it's always just, what, if, what does the Lord say? That's what it is, right? That's what I love about this church. No one gets mad at the pastor. <laughs> Moving on, I, I don't want to lie in the house of the Lord. All right. So we know that in chapter 20, Jesus is in Jerusalem, and uh, all of Luke has prepared us for what is going to unfold and what Jesus is going to say in this passage. Uh, we know that in chapter 19, verse 28, he makes his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, that by uh, verse 41, he's weeping over the city because Jesus knows that his mission into Jerusalem is not to convince a bunch of religious people to believe in him, that, that his mission is not to change people's minds that are convinced about their religion and about, about how good they are. He knows that he's not going to win over most of the religious establishment. Maybe a handful of Pharisees, we think that Nicodemus and uh, uh, maybe a couple of others began to follow Jesus, but for the most part, Jesus knew that the Pharisees and the scribes and the chief priests and the rulers of Israel were going to betray him and crucify him. We know that. And he tells us very clearly in this, par uh, in this parable that he went into Jerusalem with full knowledge of what his fate would be. Remember in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, where it says that he set his face to go to Jerusalem, that that represents Jesus turning and setting out, knowing that he was going to go to Jerusalem and that Jerusalem represented what to him? The cross, the crucifixion, all of that. And so from Luke 9, 51 until this moment, Jesus has been destined to die on the cross. All of Luke has been preparing us for this moment. And in 1947, uh, Luke 1947, uh, Luke records that the religious leaders looked for ways to destroy Jesus. And that was the first mention by Luke of their official intent, their motive toward Jesus was that they were going to try to destroy him. Why? Because he has come in, this outsider came into their city, into their temple, and turned things upside down, and turned over the temple uh, tables, the money changers. He drove people out of the temple, and he basically told them, the way you're doing religion is wrong. And they responded, what gives you the right to say these things? What gives you the right to do these things? And now in this parable, well, and then in verse uh, 1 through uh, 8, that's where we see they question his authority. What gives you the right? And now here we are in verse 9 through 18. Let me read the parable, then I'll pray, and then we'll dissect it. So Luke chapter 20, verse 9 through 18. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into another country to, for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third. This one also they wounded and cast out. When the owner of the vineyard said, or then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on a stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Now let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Um, 
God, the warning, the encouragement, the challenge, the conviction. I pray, Lord, that you help us to see in this parable not only a story to the people that lived in Jesus' day, not only to the religious establishment in Jerusalem, but Lord, help us to remember that there's nothing new under the sun. If it could happen once, it can happen again. If religious people can kill the Son of God, then maybe we could. I pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts. I pray that you help us to turn to Jesus in faith, receive him as our Savior, trust him fully and completely, and give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 9, he told him a parable. He says, a man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants. So a vineyard, you have to know, was a national symbol for Israel. It's like the, um, the bald eagle for Americans. You know, if someone were to say, like a bald eagle then we would immediately think of a very patriotic image of, of our nation, of, of the United States of America. And in the same way, a vineyard had come to represent the nation of Israel. Let me prove it. Isaiah 5, verses 1 and 7 says, Let me sing for my beloved, my love, song concerning his vineyard. Verse 7, The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. Isaiah continues in chapter 5, and he says that even though God the Father gave his people everything that they needed to be fruitful, you know, he says, I, 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 I love my vineyard, I've planted my vineyard on a fertile hill, I've given you everything that you need to produce a fruit. If you, if you are an owner and you put a vineyard in, what do you expect? You expect fruit. You expect grapes. You expect a return. Isaiah goes on to point out that in spite of all of the effort that the father put into this fertile hill and all of the preparation that he made on this vineyard, all that they bore was wild grapes. And in the end, the vineyard had to be destroyed. And so here's a parable. A man planted a vineyard and so if you're an Israelite, if you're in Jerusalem, then you know that Jesus is telling a story about you. And that vineyard represents that, that covenant promise, that intimate relationship to be God's special set-apart people. So he's speaking to the nation of Israel, speaking of the people of Israel, of Jerusalem. And Jesus says, and he led it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. We know that this means, or that what Jesus is trying to portray is God's abundant patience. He went away for a long while. He was abundantly patient with the tenants of the vineyard, expecting that they would produce a harvest. I think about uh, the, the scripture that says that God is slow to anger and quick to forgive, that he is abundantly patient, that he is long-suffering with his people. He gives lots of opportunities for his people to bear fruit. Unfortunately, like I said, Isaiah reveals to us, this is hundreds of years before Jesus, that all that Israel produced was wild grapes, and in the end, it would be destroyed Nevertheless, God gives so many opportunities for his people to repent and bear fruit. Verse 10 through 12. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third. This one they also wounded and cast out. Time after time, one after another, God sends a servant to go to his vineyard and collect what is due to him. And what is due to him from the nation of Israel is the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of holiness, the fruit of honor, the fruit of love, the fruit of faithfulness. 
God sets apart the people of Israel, gives them the promised land, says, I'm going to be your God, and you're going to be my people, and you're going to have this special relationship with the God of the universe, and it's going to be so amazing that all the nations are going to see the way that I bless you, the way that I love you, and the way that you respond to me, and it's going to draw people in, all the nations, they're going to love me too. Let me sing a love song for my beloved. And so he sends his servants to collect what's due to him, the prophets, and they go and they continually preach, repent, turn, love the Lord your God, be faithful people. And time after time, the people send the prophets away. What they should have received from the people of Israel, from the vineyard, was a great harvest of righteousness and faithfulness. And what they got instead was sawn in half and thrown off of temples and run through with spears. That's what the prophets got. That's what the servants got. Listen to Jeremiah 7, 25 and 26. I have persistently sent all my servants, the prophets, to them day after day, yet they did not listen to me. Do you hear the broken heart of a loving God for his people? Let me sing a love song over my people. I love them. And all I want is that they would love me back. I give them the choicest land. They inhabit cities that they did not build. And I give them my blessings, and I give them my mercy. And time after time after time, I send my servants preaching the message of repent and love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And time after time after time, they beat my prophets and they kill them and they send them away empty-handed. I don't get what I'm due from my people. And as we begin this, Wildwood, I'm, I'm burdened that if a religious people could do this once, then a religious people could do it again. If a religious people could so disdain their God, then a religious people could do it again. There's nothing new under the sun. This parable is a warning to religious people. Jesus is speaking to religious people who have questioned his authority. What gives you the right to come in here and tell me how to live? What gives you the right to tell me that God has a claim on my life, that I owe God something? What is so shocking is that these are devout people. These are people that would gather at the temple to worship on a regular basis. And the indictment, is that when God sent his servants to his people, they beat them and said, we don't want any of that. We're not listening to that. And they sent them away empty-handed. Verse 13, Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 says, Long ago, and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he spoke to us by his son. God spoke to the people of Israel by the prophets, and now he speaks through his son. One commentator says that Jesus is identifying himself and is, in fact, God's last and most gracious attempt to bring the people of God to repentance the last and most gracious attempt to win God's people back. Notice that Jesus says, I will send my beloved son. He's speaking on behalf of the owner, which in this parable represents God the Father. And so Jesus knows who he is. He knows who he, whose he is and who he is. He knows his identity. He knows that he is God's beloved son. And in this moment, in verse 13, we want to shout as we read the story. We want to say, God, no, no. 
What a mistake that would be to send your son to your rebellious and wicked people. If your people would not hear and heed the words of your prophets, what makes you think that they would hear and heed the words of your son? Don't do that, God. And yet what is clear, what is inevitable, is that God did send his beloved son, his only begotten son, and he did it expressly and specifically so that he would die. Jesus knew exactly what these religious people would do to him. And I'm afraid, folks, I'm afraid that if Jesus were to come back today, not as conquering king, when he, when he comes back, uh, there will be zero rebellion. But if Jesus were to come back the way he came the first time, if we were the people that received this Jesus, then I'm afraid that religious people would kill him again. I'm afraid that devout religious people would put him on a cross again. Jesus said some really bold, really strong things to religious people. In fact, it was the religious leaders that got the brunt and the hardest end of Jesus' stick. In fact, he had mercy for for everybody, but for the Pharisees, for the religious leaders, for those who rejected God's salvation, there was nothing but rebuke. Verse 14 and 15. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir, let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Luke 19, 47, Luke's already told us that the intent of the religious establishment was to kill Jesus. They sought for a way to destroy him. In, in verse 19 of chapter 20, the scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them. They understood he was speaking against them, and they wanted to lay hands on him. They were seeking a way to destroy him. They wanted to kill this man. The leaders of God's people wanted to kill God's son. We cannot allow that to be lost on us and to imagine that somehow this is unique, that because they lived 2,000 years ago, they were, they were so unenlightened, they were so uncivilized that they, they would kill the Son of God. But folks, they were religious people. They were devout. They were committed they read the word of God. They worshiped together in the temple. They did religious things, and they wanted to kill Jesus. Continuing verse 15. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. What else would you expect the owner to do? He plants a vineyard. It's his. He owns it. He leases it to tenants, and he says, make sure that it bears fruit, and they reject the prophets, they, they reject the servants that come to glean for God what is his, and then he sends his son, and they kill his son. What else would you expect God to do? What else would be just in that moment than to take away from the nation of Israel the covenant and the promise and give it to those who will be faithful. To take spiritual leadership away from the nation of Israel and give it to the apostles of Jesus Christ of the church that has now been handed down to pastors and elders. The people who are leading God's people today are no longer the Pharisees and the scribes and the chief priests. They are elders of the church. So one, we need to see a couple of warnings here. First of all, who are the tenants? There's some debate on who the tenants are, but at the most basic level, you would expect that the tenants would be those that were responsible for cultivating fruit in the vineyard. And who would that be? Well, that job description fits squarely on the religious leaders of the day, that God would have expected the priests and the Pharisees and the scribes 
to cultivate fruit of repentance and faithfulness among the people of Israel. And if that is what Jesus meant, then that's a warning to faith leaders today. Anyone that has influence over someone else in the faith should be warned by this. What kind of leadership does God want? And what kind of leadership does God rebuke? He wants and he expects and we owe humble submission to him, reverence for the word of God, and faithfulness and leading our people into faith. So elders and pastors and ministry directors and adult Bible fellowship teachers and connect group leaders and Sunday school teachers in our youth and children's ministry and parents and anyone else that has influence over someone else's faith, be warned. Be warned. God's people are not here for our benefit to use them as one of the prophets says, to consume them, but rather to shepherd them to faithfulness. But I cannot help but see in this passage a reference to Nehemiah. And at the end of Nehemiah, when God has brought all of his people back out of Babylon, miraculously, they rebuild the walls of Jerusalem that have been destroyed, and, and they're all back, in, and life in Jerusalem has been reconstituted, and Ezra and Nehemiah are reading from the law, and the people are hearing, and they say, we will obey. We will obey every part of this law. And I just think, yeah, right. Just a few centuries later, they crucified the Son of God. And so I don't think that the nation, that the people of Israel, that God's people are off the hook here. I believe that as God looks at his vineyard, he sees individuals, and that it's up to individuals to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. I think it's also a warning about anyone that would go into the world and preach a message of repentance. So many people today talk about a word of prophecy. And somebody tells me that they want to give me a word of prophecy, I'm like, all right, let me hear it. If it doesn't start with convicting me of my sin, then I don't believe it. If someone says, oh, God just has all this good for you, and that, that's the word of prophecy for me, I'm like, you're not like a biblical prophet. Because biblical prophets spoke truth, uh, uh, they foretold some events of the future, but you speak a message of repentance, you need to be prepared to suffer just like the prophets did. Because even though these were God's people, they didn't want to hear God's message. That'll sting, won't it? And if it can happen once, can it not happen again? Is it even within the realm of possibility that a group of people that call themselves by God's name could possibly reject God's message today? Is that possible? If it's possible, then is it possible among us? Folks, I am burdened that this message is for church people. This message is for church people. If you're not a church person, you, you know, the message is still for you, but I want to be very clear that this message is for people that have been in the church their whole life. If it is possible for people to be so hardened in their hearts that they would send away prophet after prophet after prophet and then kill the very Son of God, then brother and sister, don't think that, that you're above that. Test yourselves. Examine your hearts. Here is what God will do. He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, surely not. This was absolutely unthinkable. Why? Because they were inside. They were good. They were in. How were they in? They were born in. They were born Jews. They had the physical marks on their body to prove that they were in the good boy club. They were on the inside. How could God possibly take from me what is mine and give it to someone else, those dogs, those Gentiles? 
How could God do that? That's unthinkable, that God would allow someone that's dirty and nasty and outside of this community to have what we ought to have, what we are entitled to. Surely not. Verse 17, but he looked directly at them. Let me stop right there. He looked directly at them. Jesus had every right to be intimidated in this moment. I want you to imagine you have gone to someone else's city and you are outnumbered and you are telling them that they're doing religion wrong and they have you, they, they have you beat on education they're wealthier than you. They are much more influential than you. They have the populace's ears. And you know that in just a few days, they will have you on a cross. Jesus had every right to be intimidated, but he wouldn't back down. He looked directly at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone he quotes from Psalm 118, which incidentally is the same psalm that was quoted on his triumphal entry. As he rode in on the donkey, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Psalm 119, which was also incidentally a psalm of national comfort. It's like the national anthem for us. And now it's being used to indict the nation of Israel for a lack of faith. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The story goes that in 1 Kings 5, when they're building the temple, they had to, they had to hew out the rocks and stone off-site, and they bring them in, measured and cut, and they place them in the foundation. And this one stone that was brought in didn't fit exactly the way it was supposed to. And so they take that stone and they reject it. It's no good. It's thrown away. And much to their surprise, upon later inspection, when it's time to put in the cornerstone, the most important, the most significant stone, that one fit perfectly. And so it went that the stone that the builders rejected became the cornerstone. And now we see Jesus is applying it to himself. The stone that the builders reject, rejected is Jesus Christ. And though he's rejected by everybody, he's accepted by the only body that matters, God himself. And you and I need to get there. We need to get there. One, do you accept Jesus Christ as the cornerstone of your faith? Is he the most significant and the only significant piece in this salvation puzzle, Jesus. Do you believe that? Do you believe Jesus is the cornerstone of faith? And the other piece is, do you believe that the only acceptance that you really need is from God, the Father? If you're going to follow Jesus, what does that mean you're going to walk in? Rejection. But if you're doing what Jesus did, you're going to be accepted by God, and that's the only one that matters. Verse 18. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Folks, everyone will be judged on this point alone. Every single human being that's ever lived will be judged on this one point alone. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? What do you believe about Jesus? Your judgment will not be based on how did you live, what did you do, what did you not do, what did you abstain from, what good things did you do. Your salvation hinges upon the person of Jesus Christ, the cornerstone of faith. Do you believe in Jesus or do you stumble upon this stone? John 3, 14 and 15, 
Jesus says that the Son of Man must be lifted up on a cross, just like Moses raised up a serpent, and everyone that was snake bit looked at the serpent in the wilderness, and they were healed. And Jesus says, in the same way, the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who looks on him would have eternal life. And then, of course, we know what he said after that in John 3.16, when he said that, let's go to John 3.16 here. For God so loved the world that whoever I'm sorry, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Everyone who calls upon the name of Jesus, who believes in Jesus, will be saved forever. And so my question to you, church person, do you today believe in Jesus? Do you today believe the gospel? Not, the question is not, did at one point you believe in Jesus? Did at one point you follow through in obedience by baptism? Not are you a member but of a local church, but rather, do you today believe in Jesus? Do you believe that Jesus died for your sin and that without him, you are nothing? That without Jesus, you will pay for your sin forever? 1 Peter 2.6 says, For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Whoever believes in Jesus, the cornerstone of faith, the precious, chosen cornerstone, Jesus Christ, will not be put to shame. We will not meet with God's judgment. But I think that there are some people who hear the gospel message week in and week out. They hear the gospel message, and yet they refuse to come to God on his terms. There's a thing called moral therapeutic deism. You've heard me use that term before, moral therapeutic deism. It's alive and well in the world today, and I think that it might be alive in the local church the basic tenets of moral therapeutic deism is that there is a creator God. They they reject the idea that we were evolved, but there is a creator God and that he wants to somewhat be involved in our lives, but only to the extent that we need help figuring something out. So we go to God when we need a, a problem solved for us. When we can't figure out life on our own, then we go to God. We try everything we can do and then we pray. There's little concern for God's daily involvement and interaction and guidance in our daily lives, and he's just sort of the big guy in the sky to be consulted when we cannot figure things out. And our greatest purpose is to be happy to love people and to be kind and to be good because good people go to heaven. Moral therapeutic deism. It is alive and well in the world and I'm afraid that it's alive and well in the church. Now we would put parentheses Jesus, the Jesus edition of moral therapeutic deism because we drop the name of Jesus every now and then. We say, I'm a Christian, but I don't read my Bible. I'm a Christian, but I don't have a prayer life. I'm a Christian, but I don't care what God's will is for me. I just want him to solve my problems when they're too big for me to solve. The Jesus edition of moral therapeutic deism. Here's the problem with that. It doesn't save anyone. The Jesus edition of moral therapeutic deism does not save a single person. John 3.18 says, whoever believes in him is not condemned. That's a wonderful news. Whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Your salvation and your eternity hinges upon what you believe about Jesus. If Jesus is just tacked on to your moral therapeutic deism, brother and sister, you will pay dearly. 
What do you believe about Jesus? Matt Chandler said something pretty provocative, happened to catch a, a video in which he says, some of you believe about Jesus the same way that you believe about Abraham Lincoln, but not as a God to be served. You believe in the historical character of Jesus. You believe that this is a, a mostly true rendering of his life. You would certainly never argue against the Bible. You would never try to dispute or disclaim Jesus. You believe in Jesus the way that you believe in Abraham Lincoln. But like you don't submit to Abraham Lincoln, you don't submit to Jesus. He doesn't have any claim on our life. You don't owe him anything. 1 Peter 2, 7 and 8 says, so the honor is for those who believe. Once again, not did believe. Not at one time my parents convinced me to walk an aisle and pray with the pastor and be baptized because my parents had their identity wrapped up in all their children being baptized. But belief I believe the gospel today. I believe the gospel today. So the honor is for those of you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Do you stumble over Jesus? Or do you believe? Paul says, why? Romans 9, 32, why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. Here's, here's, he's, he's explaining how it is that the Jews stumble over Jesus. How religious people that are brought up in the traditions of the faith stumble over the stone of offense. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith but as if it were based on works. I'm a good person. I come to church, I read the Bible, and I agree with it. I don't, I don't disagree with what you're saying, Brian. But my question is, when you came here this morning, did you come to be changed by it? Not just to agree with it. I'm afraid that we have elevated agreement with obedience. You post something on, on Facebook, and just because you post it, you get the credit for having achieved it. I want to be a better dad. Good job, victory. Like, how, how are you being obedient in, in shepherding your family? No, no one asks that. Just the fact that you agree that that's good becomes a badge of honor. Because we come and we attend worship another badge. Folks, I, I don't want to be too critical of, of, of things that big church has done. It's, we used to reward people for bringing their Bible. We, we used to give people stickers for bringing their Bible. You can't get a better badge than a sticker that says, way to go, bring your Bible. Do you believe Jesus? By faith? Or are you stumbling over the stone of offense? You can tell that I have a burden for you. First Peter 4.17 says, For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. It begins here. Listen, if you are in the faith, then what you should be doing right now is praying for those that are sitting around you that are not. If your reaction is offense, if you're in the faith, you should be praying for everyone around you that's not in the faith. I'm not talking to you. If you're in the faith, I'm not speaking to you. 
pray for those that are offended by what I've just said. Go back to that, please. 1 Peter 4, 17, thank you. It is time for judgment to begin in the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of Christ? What's the outcome? What should the Father do to those who reject his Son? What should he do to those who kill his Son? We know the answer. We know the answer. So the question is, what is the gospel? Because that's what it's about. What is the gospel? Let's watch this video. People need to see that judgment is coming soon. They need to see what Jesus has done. They need to see Jesus' ministry as the fulfillment and culmination of all the Old Testament prophecy. And he tells us, I'm coming soon. I'm coming like a thief in the night. It could happen now. There will be a day when you stand before God. And the God who sees all and knows all will expose all. They need to see that judgment is coming And they need to get right with the Lord before it's too late. It might comfort you to think that you're a pretty good person, but that's a false sense of comfort. The Bible is very clear about our spiritual state outside of Jesus Christ. Paul tells us that we were dead in our sin and trespasses. No one is righteous, no, not one. Isaiah tells us that even our best of the best of our good works are like filthy rags. We come to Jesus and God as indebted paupers, bringing nothing but our sin guilt. We need to recognize that. We need to see that because nothing will be hidden in the day of judgment. There won't be anyone that was kind of on the outskirts, flying beneath the radar, slipping in the back. Nothing will be hidden. Everything will be exposed. The message is you're going to stand before God as judge one day. And if you go into that judgment thinking, I'll argue my case. I'll make a defense. Yeah, I didn't follow Jesus. I didn't submit to Jesus as Lord. I didn't acknowledge his sacrifice. I didn't ask for his forgiveness. I'm going to stand on my own merit. I'm a pretty good person. I I strive to make the world a better place. As long as you go into it with that mindset, you will pay forever for your sin, and you will never get out. But you can settle with the Lord today. It's better to settle than to pay for your sin. It's better to settle with Jesus. It's better to submit to him as Lord and Savior and cry out for forgiveness of your sin than it is to go into an eternal torment and pay for it for all of eternity. Now, how do we settle our case then? To settle a case is to go to your accuser and say, I am guilty. I owe you the debt. And unless and until we see how sinful we are, we will never know how much we need to get right with God. Once we do recognize that we are guilty, what do we do with that? The Bible tells us that we are to confess our sin and confess that the accusation against us is just. You see, we deserve to be held liable for all of our debt. We incurred that debt. And the just and the right punishment for our sin against an infinitely holy God is an infinite price. Romans 6, 23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. Once we have come to believe that we are indebted to an infinitely holy God, and we confess that his accusations against us are just, and we believe that the just payment for our sin is eternal death, then we start to see our hopeless estate. Then our eyes are open to how desperate we really are. And when we are desperate, and when we recognize that we would never be able to repay, then we seek to settle. The gospel means good news. Up to this point, it's not really been all that good. But what makes the gospel the the gospel, what makes it good, is that our case is easily settled. The same one who judges is willing to be our savior. This is how God can be both just and righteous in punishing sin and also justify those who confess their sin. He credits the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross 
to the account of everyone who recognizes their need for a Savior, confesses their sin, and cries out for forgiveness. Jesus is the means by which we settle our accounts once and for all. The resurrection is a sign that Jesus' sacrifice for sin has been accepted by God and is redeemable by us, and that now, through faith in Him, our sins are forgiven, and we have an eternal hope to see the signs of the cross and the empty tomb and to understand what they mean and to trust Jesus for salvation. Jesus said in John 5, 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Brother and sister, that is my prayer for you. And whether you've been in the church your entire life or you are tuning in for the very first time, my hope and my prayer and my exhortation to you is that you would believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, that you would not pass into judgment, but would have eternal life. Right now is the moment of salvation. We're not guaranteed another second. Folks, right now you may be having a little bit of an identity crisis because I'm asking you, do you believe the gospel? And I'm speaking to church people. And I'm speaking to people that have comforted themselves their whole life that because they're in church, they're in Christ. But let me tell you very plainly, you can be in church and not be in Christ. If it happened once that religious people could crucify the Son of God, could reject their Savior, it could happen again. And so right now in this moment, I'm asking you the question, do you believe the gospel? Do you believe in Jesus? And you might be thinking, well... I, I can't go there because what would my kids say? What would my spouse say? What would my grandkids say? What would my class say? What would my connect group say if I just now became a follower of Jesus, born again right here? What would that mean of all of my life? That doesn't matter. What matters is do you believe the gospel today? And if the answer is yes, praise the Lord. And if the answer is I have just come to believe the gospel today, then you need to choose today to follow. And we don't usually do invitations, but I'm going to do an invitation this morning, and we're going to invite the worship team to come back. I'm going to give an invitation. You need to step out in faith in Jesus Christ. Do not rely upon your supposed goodness that you have come to church your whole life, that you have read your Bible, that you've brought your Bible, that you have the certificates at home to prove that you're a good person. Rather, do you believe in Jesus today? As the worship team plays this invitation, I'm going to stand right here. And if you're in the faith, I'm asking you to be praying for this group of people. Last service, we had a person come to faith. Praise the Lord for that. Brother and sister, I'm speaking to you. I'm speaking to you, church person. Religious people kill Jesus. Don't think that you're beyond that. Call out to him as a sinner in need of a Savior today. Father, we love you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for being patient with us for sending prophet after prophet after prophet, for sending Jesus, and then sermon after sermon after sermon. Soften our hearts, Lord. Help us to love you. Help us to submit to you. Help us to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Help us trust in Jesus. In his name I pray, amen.